with Larry, the director of the BAM PFA, museum, film archive, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, 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 all the above. Hippie modernism. Mm -hmm. Struggle for utopia. Yeah. We still struggling for a utopia? Yes, we're struggling for utopia. Like, this week, we're struggling to be just normal. If we could just be normal, it would be cool. But once we get over that hump, yes, let's struggle for utopia. Okay, I love this notion of normal. So in the 60s, they mm -hmm. promoted a non-conformist lifestyle. Mm -hmm. To what were they so opposed to conforming? They were opposed to conforming to a heteronormative, military, industrial, mind-numbing, educationally bankrupt society. You make it sound like something you wouldn't want to conform to. <laughs> Not in the least, no. And people woke up to that. They woke up to this sort of nightmare of normalcy. I mean, at that time, I think, you know, they're coming out of the 50s and all these, you know, just this stifling conventions of behavior and life, which wouldn't be so bad if the world was at peace and everybody was prosperous and treated equally. But when the world is at war and you're in danger of, like, being shipped overseas and napalmed and people are being discriminated against and you can't express who you really are. All this adds up to kind of a bad normal. And so people struggled against it and overthrew it. Uh, they overthrew that regime of normalcy. <laughs> oh boy. Wow. So what were some of the most obvious successes of the movement that mm. still influence culture today? God, so much. Uh, so much of what we take for granted today, or what we took for granted up until about two months ago, as our normal, that is to say, a society in which people deserve respect, in which people are free to be different, um, in which we respect the planet and understand it as a whole system, where if you harm one part, you har harm the other. Uh, a world in which men and women are equal and love each other for what they are. These are all things that we owe to the counterculture. Um, and they're under th threat now. This normal, what was normal up until a little while ago, is now under, under threat. And we have, to, we have to resist all over again. What tangible alternatives do you feel they offer to our current way of life? Tangible alternatives? Well, I mean, for example, recycling. That's not so sexy, but there it is. At one time in the not-so-distant future, when you had stuff you didn't need anymore, you threw it in the garbage. And the result of that was mountains of trash, toxic garbage that just was piling up all over the planet. The whole idea of recycling comes out of the counterculture. The idea that we are one whole system and that if you take from one place, you need to give back in another, that things can have a cycle, that they don't just begin and end. This sort of idea that you could take a bottle and transform it back into another bottle is a kind of trippy idea in a way, and it comes out of a way of thinking about whole systems and cycles that is very much connected to the counterculture. So recycling began as a kind of a, a flaky idea, you know, coming out of someone's, I don't know, maybe someone's acid trip or something. But that fairly quickly, particularly here in California, became government policy thanks to Jerry Brown and a lot of other visionaries who went from the streets into government and took ideas that were considered very fringe at the time and made them into government policy. And again, that's not such a sexy thing, but it is one of the reasons why the counterculture was so effective, is because of people like that who did the hard work to take what were thought of as crazy ideas and make them into protocols, policies, laws. So it, it, it seems to me like these are pretty obvious fundamental core issues that we would care about. If we just checked our heart for a second, we'd care about why were, why were they counterculture and not mainstream? Just wanting to recycle, take care of the planet, recognize our in inherent innate connection to all that is. Why yeah, so I mean, counter? <laughs> we take the, I tell you, we take these things for granted. And especially here in the California and in the Bay Area, these ideals became the norm, became the norm. We're very lucky. We've been floating on a beautiful cloud and in a, a little bit, you know, to use another metaphor, in a bubble. Uh, and that bubble has burst, unfortunately. 
yeah, it's it's a it's a struggle. I guess it's a struggle forever. And a new generation has to reach into their hearts and find the same wisdom, and find a way to express it in in the present. It can be a fun struggle. I mean, that's one of I think one of the lessons of the counterculture period is that you can have fun resisting. It doesn't have to be all you know. First of all, violence is not necessarily the way to go. Uh, there's plenty of other ways to resist. The very principle of free expression, which is so important for us all to remember, was core to the counterculture. Uh, there's a lot of things that one can say and express to win hearts and minds. You don't have to hit someone over the head to do it. I think that the, the drive to call on our creativity before we call on our anger is one of the messages of the counterculture. And again, there can be a lot of fun and humor in that. That's something you discover when you run a museum. <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm very lucky to work in this atmosphere where I, you know, I'm reminded of these things every, every day at work. I mean, art brings you back to that, to that place every day. The message, as I understand it, all throughout was a message of love, a message yeah. of unity. Yes, for sure. A message sure. of, come on, people, yeah. check your heart, let's right. get together, yes. try to love one another right now. Absolutely, that's it, in a nutshell, yes. <laughs> well, uh, along those lines, at Soul, we always love to wrap with a hug. All right.